Hmm. Um, welcome, everybody, to the fifth session in this seminar series, Challenges for a Cyber Physical World. I'm your host again, Kayleen Manwaring, and congratulations for making it so late in the year. I know this is the time when you want to go to stuff, but you either have to go to your Christmas parties or you have to finish all your work before you can go to your Christmas parties um, or go on holiday. So, um, but I don't think you'll be disappointed. This is, I've been um, so excited to, in a minute, introduce our speaker for today. But firstly, I'd like to show my respects and acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm located today and to their elders past and present. And I would invite anybody who feels they would like to, to do the same in the chat. Um, uh, I would. I am so excited to introduce Dr. Guido Notola Diega, who is a scholar whose own work I've been following for many years and has informed a lot of my own work. Um, they are an associate professor of intellectual property and privacy law at the University of Stirling. Um, at Stirling, Dr. Notola Diega leads the IP and media law courses, coordinates a fabulous research network, the Scottish Law and Innovation Network, um, directs the Just AI Lab and is deputy chair of the Faculty's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and also carries out research at the Centre for Research into Information Surveillance and Privacy, also called CRISP. Um, now, also recently, um, Associate Professor Nadella Diego has been um, appointed as a uh, global law professor at the School of Law at the University of Connecticut. He's also a fellow of the Nexus Centre for Internet Society. Um, and the list goes on. Um, uh, Guido's main expertise is in the Internet of Things, and I think he knows more about it than any other lawyer I know. Um, but he also does work in artificial intelligence, cloud computing, robotics, and blockchain. Um, most importantly, their work is animated by the conviction that the law should be pivotal to socially just, diverse, and sustainable technologies. So I'm about to hand over to Guido um, just to let you know that um, what we'll do in terms of questions, well, there'll be a bit of time for questions and answers at the end, but Guido has to leave dead on um, 7 p.m. because he has to which is 8 a.m. his time because he has to catch a train. And um, the questions will be through the chat, which you can do any time, but we will leave the questions till the end and then I'll reflect the questions back to Guido um, at the appropriate time. But you can enter questions at any time in the chat. Um, so over to Guido. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kayleen. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm thankful, obviously, to you for organizing the UNSW Alliance Hub for Technology Law Innovation, IEE SSIT Australia, for supporting um, as well. Um, I'm delighted and I'm sorry for all the very long list of things that I'm doing, etc. Uh, I think the most important thing to say is that I am the European equivalent of Kaylin uh, because we are the IoT people, I think. We are one of some of the IoT people uh, in the world that have been obsessed with the IoT for a very long time. I think we influenced each other uh, in, uh, in many ways and hopefully we also influenced and learned uh, from others. Um, so this is my Australian uh, book launch. Uh, so I'm very, very happy. I had the UK book launch two or three days ago, uh, at the Faculty of Advocates uh, in, uh, in in Edinburgh, and that went well. So hopefully this is not going to be a, a, a disaster. Um, I suppose as a kind of a first uh, thinking point is, uh, why does this talk has to do with uh, Ukraine uh, and tractors? Um, well, this is this was one of the things that really inspired me and and brought me to uh, sort of to, to take a new direction in uh, in my research. Uh, this is before the, the current uh, war, uh, obviously. Uh, in 2017, a number of uh, uh, of farmers, farmers around the world, decided to embrace smartness. 
they decided to um, to buy new tractors, smart tractors, very cool tractors with uh, cool displays and some cool software running in them, etc. Uh, all of them produced by kind of the leading uh, leader uh, in the in the market that is called John Deere. Um, and at some point, uh, what, what you know what happens with equipment like tractors very often is that they broke they break down. Uh, that's not nothing kind of uh, unusual. Uh, what was unusual was that that when these farmers tried to fix their own smart tractors, uh, they essentially they were sued by the manufacturer that uh, th that decided um, that independent repairs of uh, their tractors would qualify as a form of copyright infringement. Uh, because as I said, there was a software running in the machine um, and, and uh, attached to the software, there was an end user license, license agreement, a contract that said that you can only repair uh, the soft, the, repair the software and therefore the tractor uh, if you go to our uh, authorized repairers. And you know, this was a big shock uh, for uh, for far for farmers. You know, repairing your own tractor is part of your own identity. Uh, it's just it's even more than property. Um, so what they did was they essentially download they they hacked their own tractors using Ukrainian firmware. Uh, so firmware that was developed by Ukrainian uh, developers is developers in Ukraine. Technically speaking, this solution is illegal, uh, so I wouldn't be authorized to uh, publicly endorse it. But I do think that as researchers, as a researcher, I, I, I do find that particularly, particularly fascinating and inspiring. Um, so this is kind of a, the, the starting point to get you thinking about the things that really it's excite me about uh, about the book about the IoT and uh, and the law. So I'm gonna in the remaining time I'm gonna um, essentially give you um, a sense of what I mean by uh, IoT, why I think it's important uh, to deal uh, to deal with it. I'm gonna present some uh, some of the consumer issues. Um, in the IoT, there are many, but obviously we don't have a lot, a lot of time, uh, fortunately for you. Um, and we're going to zoom in on some solutions to uh, to the problem, uh, in particular the idea of the um, of the commons. Uh, there is no commonly accepted definition of of the IoT. Uh, Kaylin, uh, you know, uh, has presented and put forward uh, some uh, uh, some solutions, some definitions of e objects and other uh, other definitions. Um, I, I think there is, you know, uh, for me, it, it's not what I wanted to do was just to say this is what I mean by it. I didn't want to say this is what everybody should uh, define uh, the IoT as. Uh, so for me, I think uh, so I tend, I try not to refer to smart devices as smart devices. I refer to them as things, uh, but it's, it's the same. Um, so a thing is an inextricable, is an inextricable mixture of hardware, software, service, digital contents and data that has interconnectivity, sensing and actuating capabilities and interfaces the physical world. Um, now, you don't need to kind of uh, remember all of it, but I just want to kind of pick we got a couple of points in this uh, in this definition. First, physicality. Uh, so the public discourse around technologies is really dominated by uh, intangibles. Um, you know, AI, NFT, uh, the metaverse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It seems to be all about intangibles. Um, whereas I, I think that there is so much more interesting stuff happening uh, here in the physical world, in the physical dimension of uh, of innovation. And the IoT is about this. You know, it's it's about as a devices and systems that have a tangible, uh, tangible dimension. Um, obviously, interconnectivity means that uh, a thing will be connected to the internet, but also talk to other things. Uh, sensors, I suppose, it's what everybody's aware of when thinking about the IoT, the idea, you know, of the uh, different GPS and other sensors that are used to transform our physical reality in data flows, essentially. Um, and actuators is maybe something that uh, many people will not necessarily uh, be aware of uh, because the IoT is not just about sensing the reality, it's also about using 
uh, the data extracted from the reality to act on the physical world. And, you know, it can be something as, you know, something like um, um, a robot in a factory controlling some piece of machinery, uh, or it could be just you saying, you know, Alexa, what's the weather like? Uh, or Alexa, not, maybe not Alexa, Alexa, turn on the lights. So turn on the lights, it's something that ha happens in the physical world thanks to uh, thanks to sensors, etc. Um, and lastly, and I'm going to shine a light on this in the next uh, next slide. This idea of a, a nestable mixture of hardware, software, software, service, digital contents, and data. Uh, let's see what uh, let's see in a second what I mean by um, by that. But let's keep that uh, in mind. So why is it important to to deal with it? Oh, well, because um, essentially the IoT is well past the hype. This has happened. Uh, I, th I think without many people like maybe being aware of it, realizing it, the IoT has happened because you know we have double the amount of smart devices than we have people in the world. Uh, IoT innovation grows nearly eight times faster than other uh, than all other technologies. Um, the IoT generates uh, turnovers that are higher than smaller and and some developing states um and uh, and you know so so that's a big deal it's happening it's it's really economically important societally important as we'll see uh in a second and i'm particularly look at uh although not exclusively uh, smart home because smart home is that uh, most profitable segment and the market leader is amazon which makes it for a very fun uh thing to do to take a case study approach that uh focuses on obviously on Amazon. Um, so going back to this this idea of um, you know of rematerialization of this mixture between hardware software service and um, and data. Uh, as lawyers we've been sort of struggling and, and reflecting uh, for I think over um, a century now uh, about how do we how do we use laws that were designed for the tangible world uh, how do we apply them to the intangible world? Uh, so, you know, laws around, uh, for example, uh, products, how can they cope in the context of software? That's that's one of the things that, you know, we've been doing for a long time now, um, etc. Et now, what, what's interesting in the IoT is the opposite, is that uh, things that used to be intangible, like software service, data, digital contents become tangible because become Im embedded in a physical uh, in a physical device. In this sense, we can say that smart devices are non-binary or we could say queer uh, because they challenge the existing binaries between good and service, hardware and software, personal and personal, line of line, security, cybersecurity, etc. All the binaries upon which the law is nowadays uh, built and that's you know what I call the challenges you know of the of rematerialization here uh, so what the problem that uh, we need to solve is how do laws that rely on the tangible intangible dichotomy cope with a cyber physical uh, reality uh, and it, it is a huge challenge that I try to kind of respond to uh, very practically through this with the book uh, this is the table of contents, I try to take um, a problem based approach. Sometimes I fail, sometimes I succeed, uh, but uh, like like Alien and others, I, I don't want to start with the law in, in abstract and then see, you know, what problems are in the law. I want to see what problems we have in society and how the law can try and uh, and, and resolve them. Uh, and in particular, I, I consider um, I, I, in terms of finding solutions in the law, I, I try to find them in, in particular uh, in regulation, uh, kind of public enforcement and private enforcement uh, in kind of a consumer contract law, uh, but also product liability, unfair commercial practices, um, data protection, trade secrets, uh, patents, competition and competition law. These are the main kind of bodies that I kind of uh, focus uh, and where I find the kind of try and find the solutions to 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 some of the problems that I'm going to present uh, in uh, in a second. Uh, I know I don't want to be 
I think people say here a negative Nancy, but I find it a bit sexist. So uh, I don't want to be negative uh, about things. So I do recognize that uh, the IoT uh, has some benefits. I think the classic example is that if you have a driverless car, then you can free up your time because you can read the newspaper while uh, the car is driving itself. Um, but I'm not. I'm not gonna kind of go into into that. Uh, a lot of uh, lobbies of the IoT already. Do do that for me, so there is no reason for me to do that. Uh, I'm going to just briefly say something about uh, the consumer issues in the IoT. Um, today I'm going to present four of them. I don't know why only three are underlined in this slide, but they are uh, the contractual quagmire, the I IoT commerce, private ordering by bricking, and the debt of ownership. Uh, whereas I won't have time to go into the in what I call the Internet of Lose, uh, cyber vulnerability, and the Internet of Personalized Things. So if these are things that you are interested in, maybe you can uh, ask some uh, questions uh, at the end. Um, so so first, we can start with the contractual quagmire. Um, you know, if you think about what happens essentially when you ask Alexa, uh, you know, Alexa, what's the weather like? Uh, you cannot necessarily uh, predict or imagine that by doing so, you are triggering 246 contracts. Um, you are entering uh, a number of terms of use, terms of service, privacy policy, and, and user license agreement, um, uh, other kind of guidelines, uh, usage usage rules, warranties, licenses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But simply by interacting with a very simple smart devices, you are entering into a web of contracts, a contractual. Uh, Quagmire. Uh, these contracts are incredibly hard to find. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks to try and find them all. I still don't think I found them all. I'm sure there are some more out there. And this is annoying because there is a, the legal section on the Amazon website. So you should be able to find them all there. Instead, only nine out, out of 246 are there. Um, it's not just about being hard to find. It's also about what are these contracts about? You know, what, what do they cover? It's really hard to understand because, you know, there is the Amazon device terms that, uh, you know, in theory should be about the hardware and in, in, in reality it's about the software. Then they tend to define what's a service in 1000 different times. Sometimes a product is part of a service, sometimes it's not. It's really, it's really difficult to understand what's the scope of these. We can call them contracts. Uh, I think depending on the jurisdictions, many of them or some of them will not qualify technically speaking as contracts. So I will call them legals. Um, I think it's a more it's more accurate um and then the other problem is that uh, as lawyers it's particularly pressing is that often uh the contractual party is un unidentified so we we don't know who was this contract with who is behind uh behind the contract uh and that makes it very hard to for example bring uh, a legal action against them if we don't know who they are um and often the problem is that uh, amazon refers to the concept of affiliates uh, and we know that the contractual party is an affiliate, but we don't know who they are because nobody tells us who the affiliates are. There is no official kind of map of these affiliates, and I still to this day don't know who they are. Um, the, they are also very difficult to read, uh, illegible, one may say, because you need a university level uh, education to be able to start to understand them. And I would say even with a PhD in law, uh, I struggle to understand them. Um, and if we just consider not all of 246 contracts, but only the 24 core legals, so only those that are really more important for you, uh, it, it would take you 20 hours to read them. They are 457 pages long, uh, so as long as a Harry Potter book. So every time you say, you know, Alexa, tell me a joke, you should be reading a, you know, a Harry Potter long uh, document with all the legals. So that's obviously a, a problem. How do we resolve it? Um, I mean, there are many ways, for example, um, Public enforcement is one of the things to uh, to consider. Um, the in the UK, the Competition and Markets Authority uh, a couple of years ago decided to intervene in the field of cloud contracts and asked 
um, Amazon and other providers of cloud to uh, to change their contracts to make them uh, fair. For example, one of the points was that you cannot simply uh, change uh, change the contract and change the service without uh, telling consumers, without letting letting them uh, leave uh, the service if they want to, it's, and and other aspects. So based on, uh, on on sort of those uh, that intervention uh, of the Competition and Markets Authority, I analyzed uh, not only that contract that was changed, but also all the other contracts. If we go back again, it's not just one contract; it's 246. So the Competition and Markets Authority intervened only with regard to the Amazon Drive terms. Um, that you can see at the top of this pyramid, uh, but the other contracts were remained the same with the same unfair uh, terms in them. Um, so I analyzed then the contracts where there is um, some sort of economic advantage, direct economic advantage for Amazon, uh, for example, in the case of Prime, uh, because obviously with Prime you pay a subscription, so there is the incentive of money for, uh, for the company. Uh, but then there are the majority of services um, that are actually in theory for free because you're paying with your personal uh, data. And what I found was that Amazon Drive, the one that was changed as a result of the Competition Markets Authority inquiry, was the only actually fair contract. Uh, prime terms, device terms, the contracts that were connected to paid for services, they were less fair than Amazon Drive, uh, but still quite, uh, still quite unfair. And that's, that's because there was the money as an incentive. When only personal data, the prospect of personal data is uh, the incentive, like Alexa terms, conditions of use, then the contracts are really, really quite unfair. Um, now, so moving on to the second, uh, the second issue in the uh, that I want to present briefly today, um, and this uh, is the issue of IoT commerce, where where e-commerce meets essentially the IoT. Uh, so we, you know, imagine you enter into uh, into your kitchen and all of the devices uh, in your kitchen, some with screens, some without without screens, some with there are voice controlled, some that are controlled with your movement. Uh, all of them are connected and potentially ready for you to give them orders to buy something. Uh, so it's going to increasingly happen that you're going to buy something without even realizing it because you don't know exactly which of your devices you are interacting with if you're just you know uh, giving orders with a blink of an eye and this i am influenced by uh, the work of our friend eliza uh, Eliza Mick. Uh, the problem in legal terms, well, there are a number of problems e here in legal terms. One of them is that uh, in the EU, but I can imagine that in Australia you have similar rules. Uh, you have to provide certain information uh, before the contract is uh, is concluded. And how can you provide, uh, in particular, this information has to be legible. How can you provide legible information in a context where there is no uh, where there is no interface, there, there is no display, for example. It's only uh, the voice, for example. Uh, it's or it's your smartwatch, or it's so small that you cannot even read it. Um, one solution could be legal design, and so the idea of in, what I call interface continuity. So if the way what I put forward is that if the way that uh, you're interacting with a device is the voice, then the, the, the device should provide information with the same interface, so, so through, uh, through sound. So, hi, I'm your Amazon Echo. I'm brought to you by Amazon EU SARL, for example. Um, obviously, this would require changes uh, in the law. Uh, because the law is still very much text uh, based to focus on this concept of uh, of legibility. Um, the third con the third issue in the uh, in the IoT is pri private ordering by break in and in this I'm influenced by uh, uh, Natasha Tusikov that was introduced to me actually by uh, Kaylin. Um, the concept of private ordering is something I've been obsessed with for a very uh, for a very long time. Um, Essentially, when we went to, to law school or, uh, or when we started studying law, I think, at least in my case, what they taught me was that the law was only, you know, the constitution, the statutes, um, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe case law. And even that wasn't so sure that it was actual law. Whereas 
uh, the more you study the IoT, the more you realize that uh, the law is also the law that is uni unilaterally imposed by private lawmakers, ma by uh, IoT companies themselves, uh, you know, through design, through uh, terms and conditions, through private practices. Uh, IoT companies take advantage of legal gaps and of the slowness of the lawmaking process to impose their own rules. Uh, so this is the concept of private ordering. One of the manifestations of private ordering is this idea of breaking that Natasha has been uh, has been working on. Um, I don't know if if you're all familiar with the concept of breaking. Um, it's essentially the idea that even after uh, an IoT company sell you a smart device, they retain control over it, uh, you know, through uh, through end user license agreements, through contracts, through control over the software, um, etc. And this this remote control over the device post sale uh, means that the manufacturer can uh, downgrade your uh, your device, can remotely delete some content, uh, discontinue software updates, determine the things uh, lifespan. Um, etc. I mean, the, the, the famous case obviously is uh, the deletion of Orwell's 1984 ebooks from uh, users Kindle, uh, Kindles some years ago. You know, some people bought, uh, you know, 1984. They wanted to read it on their on their Kindles, and at some one day they woke up and and 1984 disappeared uh, because apparently Amazon had decided that there was, but because somebody had alleged some copyright infringement. Um, and and that was quite shocking for uh, for most uh, people. And now we live in a reality where everything can become like like that Kindle. Every every day you can wake up and your uh, smart um, your smart watch uh, is bricked. It doesn't work anymore. It's been deactivated uh, remotely. Uh, bricking includes uh, planned obsolescence. Um, so you know the fact that a uh, smart uh, smart manufacturer can decide to uh, to terminate your your um, your device before its natural uh, sort of end. Uh, so so this brings me to think again about solutions. Uh, the the most famous solution to the problem planned obsolescence is the so-called right to repair, uh, which I think is also a big big discussion uh, in uh, in Australia. Maybe maybe Kaylin, you can confirm it, uh, with with me later um, in the UK, they, we introduced uh, the the eco design regulations in 2021. Um, that in theory they were uh, uh, sort of welcomed as an, uh, as um, providing the right to repair. Obviously, they don't do that. They only provide an obligation to make available spare parts, and they don't apply to the most important of smart of smart devices like smartphones. So obviously, immediately it was said that the UK's right to repair already needs repairing. Uh, so the right to repair doesn't seem uh, necessarily a, a good solution, not uh, yet. And in general, I would say a right based approach is not a, a necessarily a clever solution to the problems of the uh, of the IoT. Maybe it's something we can unpack during, uh, during the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm just going to skip over, over this because I can see that we don't have a lot of time left. There are uh, a number of different solutions to the problem. Um, you know, there is law reform, there is you know, the solutions by design, uh, ethics, I'm not interested in any of them. Uh, I think all of them have uh, intrinsic problems. I'm not saying that we don't need them. I think we do need them as part of the solution, uh, but as what I call tactics rather than strategies. So these are all tactics, but they will never resolve the problems if we don't have a more strategic approach. And I think a more strategic appro approach comes from the idea of the commons. Um, we'll see in a second what uh, what I mean commons as applied to the IoT. Um, I don't because I don't know exactly who is in the room. I'm going to say something very basic about the commons uh, to introduce them um, just in case somebody might, maybe is not aware of them. Um, the, the idea of the commons is traditionally associated with um, with some sort of physical resources that can benefit uh, co a collectivity uh, or a society more generally, like uh, forestries, fisheries, 
um, underwater resources, etc. Um, and whereas in recent years, we've had the recognition that uh, a commons is not necessarily physical, it can be also intangible, uh, like uh, knowledge as a commons, information as a commons, data, data commons, creative commons, digital con commons, even internet has been presented as, uh, as a commons. Uh, one of the sort of key tenets of, of this is that, you know, if I share uh, an idea with, with you, then at the end, we both are going to have an idea. You're not, the fact that, I, that you now have an idea is not taking it anything away from me. So sharing the context of the commons is something that increases value. It doesn't decrease, uh, it doesn't decrease value. Um, within the context of new technologies, the relationship between the commons and new technology is an ambiguous relationship. Uh, what's usually uh, the case is that uh, new technologies uh, make the commons more vulnerable because to put it in Hesse Nostrum's words uh, because of their ability to capture the previously uncapturable. New technologies uh, help you for think about um, digital rights management uh, and all the new forms of digital rights uh, management that that we have. Uh, but I'm not uh, in the, I'm not so interested in that. That's that's true and that's obvious. What I'm more interested in is how actually new technologies, and in particular the IoT, can play a positive role in the robustness in making the commons more uh, robust. So the, there are two meanings of the commons, uh, at least in my mind, when we talk about new technologies, in particular the IoT. One meaning is the idea of open access. Um, so obviously uh, free, uh, libre, uh, open, open source software, open data, etc. And this is not going to be uh, the focus of my talk, um, just because there is so much more research on, on that. So I don't need to go into that, but I think I have some interesting ideas on that. So if, if it's something that excites you, we can uh, definitely discuss it uh, during during the Q&A. Um, what I'm more interested in is the second meaning of the commons, uh, is the idea of the commons as a place for collective resistance, uh, a, a commons where a place where uh, the society and groups can regain control over, uh, over tangible and intangible resources to subvert the status quo. Um, and the classic exam example is the illegal occupations of uh, theaters that had been abandoned by, you know, for example, the city council or the legal occupations of parks that have been sold to private developers, um, etc. Again, I'm going to skip the idea of the, the commons as open access, but uh, if you're interested in it, um, we can discuss it later. The only thing to keep in mind is that precisely because the IoT is a mixture of an, an inextricable, inextricable mixture of hardware, software, and all the other elements, if we want to have an open IoT, we need to open all of these elements. Uh, so we need to obviously to have free and open source software, uh, open data, open hardware, but also open st standards and open platforms. Um, but let's focus on the idea of commons as a place for collective um, resistance. Um, I would say for me here, probably the starting point uh, is Marx. Um, Marx in a way uh, unveils uh, well, criticizes Locke. Locke, we as lawyers, we use it, uh, especially as as teachers uh, of law, uh, we use it a lot to explain why property exists and and by extension why intellectual property exists. Um, essentially, you have uh, a property exists because people work, and by working they produce value, and therefore they have a right over the 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 outcome of that uh, of that labor. That's kind of a, the simple explanation of that. Uh, and its tenets, according to Locke, is that individuals who fail to produce value have no claim to, uh, to property. Marx unmasks the Lockean fiction. What Marx shows is that in the 18th century factory, labor is collectively organized. So if there are any property rights that follow from labor, these rights have to be collective rights. So the property should be collective. 
uh, collectivized rather than being um, individual. Uh, so in a way, uh, what, what, what really inspires me here is to think about to think about us uh, as citizens and consumers of IoT devices. Uh, it's us. We are producing value. We are producing value through our data. Uh, it's not the IoT company that is producing uh, value. If we accept that what's really valuable in the IoT is mostly uh, it's mostly data. So in a way, we are un unwitting uh, and unaware workers of the new uh, of the new era. And as such, we should have collective rights over data and over the IoT more generally. Now, as I said, traditionally the Commons as a place for collective resistance was conceived, in a, you know, around physical resources, so occupation of parks. Whereas we haven't seen so far the occupation of the IoT or the occupation of the internet. Um, and and for me, the IoT in this way provides really an unprecedented opportunity to extend the conflict from the physical world to the cyber physical world because now you know thinking about rematerialization that i mentioned at the beginning now that those intangible resources have a tangible expression maybe this is going to inspire people to really uh, to really fight for these things, fight for the IoT. Uh, how do we fight? There are many different ways. I'm not going to mention um, all of them. Um, I mean, one a classic example of collective resistance is uh, unionizing, um, and we've seen it uh, in Italy, for example, uh, where the largest and most important trade union brought a successful action against Deliveroo, showing that their algorithm uh, was uh, discriminatory. Uh, but we've seen, we know that in the US there are, for example, a lot of issues around unionizing, uh, especially in the tech community. Uh, but we've seen the tech clash, uh, or, you know, Google, Google workers walking out, uh, organizing, um, you know, organizing against their employers uh, because they didn't want their technologies to be used, for example, in, uh, in war contexts. Uh, more, you know, we've seen other things are like things like strategic litigation, class actions, um, or works done by uh, consumer groups. Uh, but I'm more interested in community-led projects like the Open IoT Certification Mark uh, or Aribada, Arduino, OpenTech, etc. And even more interesting for me uh, are the nearly 2,000 uh, IoT-focused meetups around the world with well, over 1 million five. 500,000 members, um, many of them in the global south and in a lot of them in the southeast of Asia, the groups of people that week after week meet to discuss uh, and to see and to create a vision for uh, for the IoT. I think that's where the solution uh, really uh, really lies, especially if we find sustainable ways to uh, to to organize collectively. And one of the things that we we have seen, obviously, is the the rise of data cooperativism. Um, so and and this sort of brings brings us back to. Um, to the right to repair, not as a solution, because I said right focused approach approaches that don't excite me, but as a movement, a lot of uh, not for profit groups, uh, bottom up community led groups are organized around the world to claim their right to repair their own uh, devices. Uh, and this really, really uh, is exciting. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just going to say one last uh, one last thing. Uh, that is, what what's really important is understanding that the only way that we can win this uh, fight, you know, of kind of collectively organizing to fix the IoT is through alliances, new alliances that maybe were unthinkable uh, some, some time ago. And in this, I'm inspired by the father of critical race theory, uh, Derek Bell, and the idea of interest convergence. You only win the fight when the interests of many different people and groups align. And, and that's what we are starting, starting to see now. For example, with uh, Amnesty International was, you know, traditionally uh, focused on things like torture and now they've created, you know, Amnesty Tech. So the idea that you cannot fight for human rights if you don't fight, uh, you know, uh, for better technology or which means often against big tech, but it goes obviously beyond 
beyond that. And or the fact that last just last week uh, it was the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights was created and who created it Two women led uh, women led groups like Equality Now and women leading in AI. Uh, so groups that were uh, maybe focused on uh, on gender now uh, they go uh, much, uh, you know, much beyond it. So to conclude, uh, you know, there has been a lot of work on kind of uh, to warn people of, of the risks of the IoT. Probably surveillance capitalism is the most uh, known work, but uh, I think it's important to understand that it's it's not about just about privacy and data protection that are really important, but it's not just about that. It's all, it's about all of our fundamental uh, rights. Even even more that more than that, it's it's about our identity. Tactically, there are a number of things that we can do to, to fix the IoT, public and private enforcement, law reform, legal design, human computer interaction, a lot of different very cool things, uh, strategic litigation. Strategically, um, I think it's much more uh, interesting to think about the commons, not only as the place for you know open source and open access, which is really good, really important, uh, but crucially the place for uh, collective resistance and and in in a way I do think that the IoT does create this unprecedented opportunity to extend the conflict from the physical to the cyber physical world and to do that we need to find and, and create new alliances to uh, to sort of occupy the IoT and ultimately fix it thank you